back to Shattering Myths, uh, the program that is devoted to the largest segment of society, those of you who realize that all of the world's religious, political, economic, and military institutions are corrupt, as are media. Spokespeople, even counterproductive. I am Yana. Our number over the next three hours is 877-300-7645. We are going to endeavor to give you a, um, a complete program today. Now, yesterday we shortchanged you 30 minutes as a result of uh, storms and a power outage in uh, Minneapolis. And the fact that, uh, that Scott was out playing hooky yesterday, uh, out gallivanting around. Uh, actually, he was having uh, an examination on his tooths to uh, see how he can recover from um, from uh, a little uh, periodontal uh, issue. And uh, so no one knew the phone number here in, uh, in my East Coast studio, and I just kept on blabbering. I tell you what, Scott, I did a fine job of delivering news that only my dog benefited from hearing. Well, nicely done. <laughs> yeah. The dog is smarter for it. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, so that are more irritated. Who knows? Uh, news today out of Washington is that the United States is going to position the tanks, artillery, and other military equipment in uh, Eastern and Central Europe. The U.S. Defense Secretary, Ash Carter, announced uh, this morning moving to reassure NATO allies unnerved by Russia's intervention in the Ukraine. Boy, nothing says pace like uh, tanks. Nothing says we're in it uh, to tone down the, the alarm, the rhetoric, the conflict. What we want is everyone just to get along. We're in favor of democracy more than tanks and artillery. Don't you think that is just a perfect answer to Russia is, uh, is perhaps, uh, don't know for sure, sending some military hardware to protect ethnic Russians who want no part of the gang rule in Kiev that is receiving tens of billions of dollars of Western support of which they're using to purchase weapons and also NATO intelligence to go fight their own citizens with their army and uh, and yet we're miffed at the Russians for trying to defend ethnic Russians in a country that for all but 20 of the last 200 to 300 years has been part of Russia and so our answer to that is tanks and artillery and other weapons being brought to Eastern and Central Europe. You know, Scott, I predicted this the day that this story uh, emerged, the day that I learned that the United States had a wire discussion, a telephone discussion, actually, with the thugs in Kiev that were using Molotov cocktails to bring the elected government down, that it was, when I learned that it was our State Department that had inspired the, the armed revolt that led to the demise of the elected government in the Ukraine. I recognize that this was Obama and the and NATO and the U.S. military trying to reprise the Cold War, trying to give a purpose to NATO, giving a purpose to the U.S. military, since everything the U.S. military has done over the last two decades, three decades, four decades, five decades, has been an utter disaster. Every time that the U.S. military has been used over the last 50 years, it has made a bad situation worse. So the last time that the U.S. military was perceived as having prevailed was when it was not used in the Cold War. But, it was, but we managed to justify building the largest military complex the world had ever seen as a result of that Cold War, enriching and empowering lots of people. So, the boogeyman is out there again. We have a boogeyman that we can use a military for. We can, can create a, a real purpose for NATO if only we can make Russia look like an enemy. And what better way than to take the Ukraine, which had been part of Russia, whereby those in the East said, we don't want to be part of the thugs that 
took over Kiev. We don't, in this Crimea, they voted 97% to say, no, we don't want any part of you now. You allowed us to vote to separate from Russia, but now we want to vote to realign ourselves with Russia because this whole experiment in independence has been a complete farce. But no, we don't want to pay any attention to that. We want to threaten Russia so that Russia becomes the new boogeyman. Well, so this is our answer. More troops, more weapons. All the while, you know, Scott, what Russia is announcing that they're going to do, I, this is one of the stories that I delivered so eloquently yesterday. When no one's listening, I do, I guess, my best work. Russia is adding 40 new intercontinental ballistic missiles to its arsenal. So Russia is saying, okay, yeah, bring on your tanks, bring on your artillery. If you think about using them, this will be what the consequence is going to be. Russia realizes that the United States is belligerent, that we're an invasive nation, that we routinely bomb and, um, and break countries, leave them in utter chaos, that it's been what we do best. We did it in Vietnam. We uh, did it in Somalia. We did it in Afghanistan. We did it in Iraq. We're doing it in Syria. We did it in Libya. We did it in Yemen. Look at what we have made, the mess that we have made. So Russia realizes there's no stopping America. We will invade anybody with no matter how ridiculous the justification. So they're saying, all right, you want to play that game? We're going to, uh, to build 40 new intercontinental ballistic missiles. Now you know the consequence of your behavior. And the American response to that is, let's put more artillery and more tanks facing Russia. This is a nation that had uh, no desires for America to be its enemy wasn't speaking negatively about America, most certainly wasn't planning on invading America, has no capability of invading America, isn't a threat to America, didn't threaten America. But we are certainly doing our best to turn them into an enemy. And no one seems to understand who caused this. You could even go a step further. We've been very antagonistic to them. Uh, the, the NSA stuff. I mean, we've, mm -hmm. we've been spying on the entire world. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, they, they yeah. have reasons to speak ill of us, but they weren't. They weren't. They were yeah. just, you know. Like all of the, uh, the hard drives on computers uh, that were sent to, to Russia, that Russia purchased for its military and for its government and, and for its businesses, we have uh, uh, spy-enabling technology in all of them. You know, we, we spy on everybody. Uh, and for what purpose? And the Russians aren't planning on invading us. They're not planning on bombing us. You know, a friend of mine brought over a 1964 National Geographic magazine. And he brought it over because one of his father's pictures was in it. His father was part of the CIA, as was his mother, and they were stationed in uh, Afghanistan in uh, 1964. And we looked at the pictures, of course, of Afghanistan where... The, uh, the prize vehicle was a camel. The uh, lesser quality vehicle, uh, the more um, mundane vehicle was an ox. Yeah, that was the farm tractor, of course, and the mode of transportation to get uh, crops to market was uh, the backpack on uh, your, uh, you know, uh, you carry the load uh, on your head. And uh, you looked at these pictures and said, why did we invade this country? I mean, good. God, all they're trying to do is eat out a living. They're still in the Stone Age. Uh, okay, they're a little bit beyond the Stone Age, but not much. You know, most of the buildings other than the moss were mud huts, and yet we invaded. But the reason I bring up that story is that at the, at the end, the last story was a pictorial of, uh, of an enormous American radar uh, facility uh, and, uh, and listening facility that was put up in uh, along the uh, in the Anwar region of Alaska uh, on the far northern frontier of Alaska and this enormous blight on the land and it's enormous 
uh, at gargantuan expense was built so that we could uh, have uh, early warning from Russian bombers as Russian bombers would go over the poles and, and uh, therefore could drop atomic bombs on America. So this blight on the uh, environment of Alaska, this great expense to the American taxpayer, this boondoggle. Scott, do you know how many uh, Russian bombers it detected that were uh, poised to bomb America that that early warning system precluded? I'll go with zero. <laughs> that would be zero. zero. Yeah. yeah. Just think of all of the money we wasted pretending that Russia was our enemy and was poised to take away our freedoms. By, by the way, zero is a pretty solid number for the things that we do because how many terrorists plots were thwarted by the NSA the NSA spying zero I mean how many uh, terrorist plots were thwarted by the uh, CIA torturing zero zero <laughs> so, so I you mean know, they're, they're really the zero is a big number for them yeah zero is a big number how many countries were improved by America's military invasions it's a magic number, zero. Uh, zero. Yeah, yeah, we're um, we're really good at this. This whole Russian thing is just uh, so ridiculous. Uh, when I was talking to this individual who was still patriotic, I mean, I gave him an earful today. But uh, um, you know, he said his daughter went overseas, and and uh, you know, and uh, she was a teacher in Spain, and in Spain they had such a negative uh, um, attitude towards America. In fact, if you travel around the world, America, people are, throughout Europe and throughout South America, most people view America very negatively. And Americans this, have this patriotic um, conditioning that we're just the best country and everybody loves us and we're the ultimate peacemakers. We're a force for good in the world. And you know, the rest of the world knows what we are. And uh, uh, it's was amazing to hear uh, him say, gosh, you know, I just don't understand why why the Spanish uh, people are so down on America. Now, let's try some of these things. And we, we talked about um, the CIA and Al-Qaeda and the first Afghani war and Jimmy Carter and Zygmunt Brzezinski and renting the Taliban from uh, Pakistan and then uh, how we knew about the 9-11 plot five years before it occurred. It was an eye-opener for him. Not surprisingly, Greece uh, capitulated and uh, sent to the Eurozone a, a new uh, uh, debt proposal. Uh, but the Eurozone finance ministers uh, didn't bother to even discuss it. They um, ended a meeting without um, uh, any statement regarding the, uh, the new proposal. And they have gone on recess. They are... Um, uh, not going to reconvene uh, um, until sometime next week. And that means that the European heads of state uh, won't be able to reach any resolution on the debt crisis uh, when the leaders uh, uh, gather together uh, on uh, Monday, unless everybody reconsiders and decides, you know, this would make our shell game, our house of cards, uh, look very vulnerable. Uh, at least Greece is giving the pretense of they're going to be good boys and, uh, and girls, so maybe we just ought to create more pretend money and send more pretend money to them. Knowing full well, of course, that Greece has not honored any agreement that it's made in the past and won't honor the new one, and that all we're going to do is cause Greece to be more in debt. Another story that we covered yesterday in the news was uh, the growing stain on Roman Catholicism. This one in uh, the fine city of Minneapolis, uh, where GCN is headquarters, 10 days after prosecutors charged the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of St. Paul and Minneapolis of mishandling repeated complaints related to uh, clergy sex abuse, the archbishop and another top bishop resigned. They uh, uh, both were complicit in aiding and abetting the pedophiles. They covered up the pedophilia. They did what Roman Catholic clergy have done for the past 100 years. The reputation of their church 
the monies confiscated by their church, the power of their church, the influence of their church, the church's loan currency, which is its credibility, was vastly more important to them than was the well-being of the parishioners they were pretending to serve. So they let clerics abuse little children over and over again, hiding the fact that they were being sexually abused. And when the victims of abuse said, I'm being abused, they slandered the abuse victims and protected the abusers. It's what Roman Catholics have done now for a very long time. If you're a Roman Catholic, you're stupid. If you're a Roman Catholic and a parent and sending your children to uh, the church, then you're engaged in child abuse. You're aiding and abetting child abuse. You ought not be a parent. You have not got the judgment to be a parent. And that's really extraordinary when you realize in places like Ohio where the second only to public schools are uh, Catholic schools. And what's wrong with people? I mean, how can you be so oblivious to what has gone on over the past decades that you would send your child to a Roman Catholic school? I mean, haven't you read the reports that came out of Northern Ireland where they did the most extensive study? The government actually did a study of abuse and found that 30,000 boys and girls were sexually abused by the Roman Catholic clergy? 30,000 in Northern Ireland alone? I mean, Northern Ireland, what's it the size of the state of Virginia? Maybe? 30,000? So, they are continuing to, uh, to be exposed. And this idea that, oh, that sexual abuse stuff, that was something in our past, and yeah, well, maybe we did cover it up, but uh, we're, you know, we're, we've got new policies now. You don't need to worry about that anymore. Well, what uh, has happened just recently in Minneapolis has happened in St. Louis. It's happened in Philadelphia. It's happened in Boston. It's happened in Los Angeles. It's happened all around the country. And it's continuing to be ongoing, and it's happening around the world. One of the reasons that it happens around the world is that the perpetrators of sexual abuse get away with it. Um, some time ago, I reported that that the Dominican Republic's uh, Archbishop, Joseph uh, Wesolowski, uh, was indicted by the Dominican uh, Justice Department for... Uh, a litany of sexual abuse charges. In his case, they had absolute proof that he would go to the the waterside area and in a park would bribe starving children with food and would bribe uh, uh, ailing children with medicines uh, all for them to do sexually sexual acts on him perpetrate sexual acts on and they did this over a course of years and so rather than him standing trial the Vatican uh, brought him back out declared diplomatic community so this time with uh, the Roman Catholic Church they did their normal thing they pretended like they're a country with the uh, the pretense of the Vatican and uh, they uh, whisked their uh, ambassador away uh, rather than having uh, uh, whisked their ambassador whisked their archbishop away pretending that he was a diplomat as opposed to a, uh, just a religious cleric. And so they didn't allow the families of those he abused, whose children he abused, or the country itself that he was abusing to stand trial there in the Dominican Republic. Uh, and uh, what they have done is let time pass so that um, uh, folks would uh, maybe forget that the Roman Catholic, the highest ranking Roman Catholic, the Dominican Republic, which is you know, an almost an entirely Catholic uh, island, was so sexually perverted. And that the church knew about it and covered it up. And the church did know about it and did cover it up. So uh, they have, uh, since defrocked the archbishop, which is the first time they have actually defrocked a, uh, a cleric. Big deal, right? Um, and uh, now he is going to stand trial. But guess what? Public trial? No.
Trial of the Dominican Republic? No. Trial by uh, his peers? No. In terms of the, the place where he uh, committed the crime? No. Going to give it a chance for those he abused to testify? No. Public disclosure? Not on your life. This is the Roman Catholic Church. No, they're going to try him at the Vatican. Great, huh? So here you go. He'll be a sacrificial uh, individual. They'll, uh, they'll try him. They'll convict him. They'll sentence him to you know, five to ten years of uh, hanging out in the, uh, the Vatican as if it were a prison. So the cover-up from Roman Catholicism goes on. story out of Cairo is, uh, is interesting. Um, in uh, Cairo, where you are now in Egypt, you have a real mess. In Egypt, the United States made the same stupid move that we made with um, Saddam Hussein. We took what was arguably one of the best, if not the best, dictators uh, in the Muslim world and removed him from power. With Mubarak, we, we said, you know, you need to, uh, to uh, enable democracy. You know, we wanted the same thing with Saddam Hussein. Let's have some real democracy, not recognizing that, that democracy in Islam will never work and that uh, uh, Islam means submission after all, surrender. You don't have free will and votes in a, in a religion that has you surrender and submit. Moreover, Allah says in the Quran that there is no choice for Muslims, that Allah has determined their religion. And uh, their religion tells them to submit to their leaders, to their generals, uh, and to never question anything. So you can't have democracy in, in Islam, and yet that's what we tried to perpetrate on, on Egypt. And as a result, they, uh, they held the first open and fair election, and uh, in doing so, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salaf Party, which is even more fundamentalist Islamic than the Muslim Brotherhood, won about 85% of the uh, Islamic vote. Um, they, uh, they lost 5% uh, of, uh, of the vote that was uh, uh, to a secular uh, Egyptians and the 10% of Egyptians that are copped. They didn't garner any of their votes. They garnered all the rest. And as a result, the, uh, the imams telling them the people who to uh, vote for or, the, or if you don't do this, that Allah will torture you from your soul forever in hell was the sermon. They elected a Muslim Brotherhood president, Morsi. And uh, Morsi was typically Islamic, belligerent. Uh, you know, he rendered everything uh, inoperative. Um, uh, the Supreme Court he rendered inoperative. He replaced the, all of the generals in the military, including uh, the current general that has become the de facto dictator of Egypt. And he uh, began um, to revitalize the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the wellspring from which all Sunni Islamic terrorist organizations have sprung. Well, that turned out really hideous. Uh, in fact, he even wanted to engage in the war in Syria uh, on behalf of Sunni Islam against Shia Islam. That would have made a, uh, a considerable mess, would it not? And on top of all of that, then, you had uh, the military coup that America had to support because America is the sole benefactor of the Egyptian military. Uh, not only taking over the country and overthrowing the properly elected uh, government, but outlawing all political rivals, all rivals to power, outlawing them, uh, sentencing the most popular politicians, the most popular uh, people, whether they be um, Salaf, Muslim Brotherhood, or liberals, to death, rounding them up, kidnapping them, and soliciting uh, and and having the court issue a death sentence on them to hundreds of them. The most draconian dictatorship in the entirety of the Islamic world. And then, to make matters worse, we're uh, thinking that, oh, well, you know, uh, CC can't be that bad. He, um, he put an end to that horrible Muslim Brotherhood. Well, when CC came to power, largely because the cops endorsed him and, and came out in mass to protest uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and supported the military coup, what he did is uh, he allowed Muslims 
to blame the Christians for everything, and they started burning Christian churches. And the hell being perpetrated on Christians, cops, in Egypt has never been worse. But then, to add insult to injury, the very people who were the first to push for democracy in Egypt, the few secularists and the few liberals, so this is the far extreme from the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, he's rounding them up. In Cairo, they've taken them from their homes. They've taken them from the streets. They've taken them out of schools. Some have turned up dead, while others have just vanished. They are Egypt's disappeared. Scores of students and activists kidnapped by what human rights activists say is an escalation in the government's campaign against any dissent, any rival. Egyptian activists say that they have documented a disturbing rise in forced disappearances over the past two months, cases in which victims are taken without warrants and police deny knowledge of their whereabouts. The kidnapped individuals show up uh, later in court uh, and are condemned or are released later after severe interrogations. At least uh, two were recently seized by security forces who were just found dead. They couldn't endure the torture. People have disappeared in Egypt before, but definitely not at this rate, says a spokesperson for the Freedom for the Brave Rights Group. His group says that security forces have kidnapped 163 people since April, and that 64 of the 163 are still in custody or dead. Oh, what a wicked web we weave. I was watching a television program on local news the other day, and uh, it was sponsored by the University of Virginia. And everybody was wearing a T-shirt that was emblazoned with, Politics is good. Politics is good. Well, maybe they wanted to say that political correctness is good, even though it's rotten to the core. Politics have been rotten for the history of this nation. Politics are rotten throughout countries. Politicians lie. They deceive. They do anything to enhance their own positions of power. Politics is rotten to the core, folks. The more you know the more you would dislike it. And I know that most Americans have been conditioned into thinking that the party that they are associated with is good and moral and just and appropriate and fair and apple pie, and that the other political party is disruptive and chaotic and mean and hateful and, and uh, greedy and all those kinds of things. But the fact is, their view of the opposing party is accurate. It's their view of their own favorite party that is jaundice. They're both evil. Politics is bad. This is a story that begins, he lost an eye in Afghanistan and uh, earlier was reported dead in fighting in Mali. He gets around, obviously. Now Libyans say he was killed in a U.S. airstrike. But is the Algerian jihadist dub the uncatchable for his decades long elusiveness really dead? You know, this is interesting. This is a Muslim born in Algeria. He lost an eye fighting a jihad in a country that was not his. Why was he fighting in Afghanistan? He had no battle there unless it was to fight on behalf of his religion. Why would he be in Mali? He has no ties to Mali other than Muslims, fundamentalist Muslims, are, um, are rising to power, imposing Sharia law, and now fighting the French in Mali. Why would he then go to Libya? He doesn't have a dog in that fight either. So why is this Algerian jihadist such a globetrotter? What is the one universal denominator amongst all of his endeavors. Let's see, Islamic Jihad being perpetrated in Afghanistan. Islamic Jihad being perpetrated in Mali. 
uh, Islamic Jihad on steroids in Libya. U.S. officials have yet to confirm whether uh, the reports of a Mukhtar, Bel Mukhtar, was uh, killed in eastern Libya, saying that the F-15 raid appeared to have succeeded, but stopped short of confirming his demise. The main reason I wanted to share the story is, first of all, just to give you a perspective on the fact that, that, that the common denominator in these individuals is jihad. And jihad has a common denominator. All jihadists are Muslims. And Muslims have a common denominator. That would be Muhammad, the Quran, uh, Allah, and, uh, uh, of course, the Islamic Hadith, which is the oral reports from Muhammad and his companions. And second, that America was bombing in Libya. Didn't American bombs turn Libya into a literal hellhole for terrorism? Didn't we take a functioning country and uh, turn it into the most ruthless, most vicious, most terrorized place on earth? Wasn't it American bombing that led to all of that? And now our solution is, let's go bomb Libya. Good. God, are we stupid. You know, it's amazing, the change of names. There's a, if you study, for example, um, paganism, and you look at the names of the pagan gods in uh, Babylon. Now, for example, I, one of the things that's interesting in this National Geographic magazine I was looking at is that they had in, uh, in Iraq a, um, a person standing next to a Babylonian statue that was a, uh, a man bull, you know, it's like the Sphinx, uh, where you had the, uh, but this, the body was a bull, and the head was uh, that of a man, you know, that, uh, a god man, because the bull was a symbol of, uh, God. And that, uh, you know, I think they're they called Minotaur. Bell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Minotaur, yeah, absolutely. Um, and what you have in, um, in Babylon is a series of names for uh, God, most of them, um, uh, revolving around the name Lord, Bel and Baal. Uh, but as the religion of Babylon then leaves uh, Babylon and it uh, is picked up by the Assyrians, they, uh, they change the names, but the characteristics are relatively similar. Uh, and then in Egypt, same basic religion, but uh, the names change. And then the same thing would be true as uh, that religion is practiced in Greece and then Rome. The same basic storyline, same basic gods, just by different names. You're always changing the name so that it becomes confusing. Well, there was a commercial that just played. It used to be, uh, it would have been, and back in the day, a, com a commercial for longevity. But uh, a number of people found out that longevity was a hoax, a fraud, snake oil. And so they changed the name to Youngevity, hoping that that uh, you wouldn't uh, attribute it to the exposés that had been done to expose it and condemn it. And now it is uh, Brightside Ben um, is the, is what George Norrie is recommending that Doc Wallace to take you to. Now Doc Wallace, of course, is a veterinarian, but uh, nonetheless, uh, this vet wants to prescribe. Uh, uh, vitamins and minerals for you, and you should trust him with your money rather than the healthcare system in America. Why do you suppose they have to continually change their name? And maybe is there a connection between name changing and all of the frauds that have been perpetrated under the names of false gods throughout history? Like, for example, Yesterday, we talked at length about uh, this memorandum that is being foisted by Yale uh, that is being signed by hundreds of Christian clerics to declare that Yahweh and Allah are the same God. Yeah, just change the name. No one will notice. No one, just, no one will be wiser for it. Let's just change the name and continue to defraud. If I were you, I wouldn't spend my money uh, on them, but, you know, it is your call. This is the case of this individual that America was bombing, and 
why America is bombing in Libya is, uh, is uh, astonishing to me. Uh, considering the mess that we made out of Libya. But uh, this particular guy had his own militant group. His name of his own jihadist group was those who sign in blood. Those who sign in blood. Yeah, talk about a perfect name for an Islamic jihadist group. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's we're going to sign our name in blood. Right there, it's going to be your blood, by the way, that we're going to use to sign our name. He was involved in kidnapping foreigners. Uh, he took part in Mali's separatist conflict. Separatist conflict, that was the Islamic claim to, uh, to impose Sharia law. And uh, he uh, ran the Saharan uh, smuggling rings, uh, where, uh, where sex trades was uh, was a big part of the business, as was the arms trade, since Qatar provided so many weapons for the Libyan jihadists. Uh, Bel Mokhtar, I like the first name there, Bel, the Lord. Mokhtar is one of the longest standing and most connected jihadist leaders in the region, we are told. From Chris Shivas, an associate director of the Rand Institute on Foreign Policy. He was uh, the author of The French War on Al-Qaeda in, uh, in Africa. Actually, it wasn't Al-Qaeda, but nonetheless, uh, that's what Chris has to tell us. Bel Mokhtar followed the well-worn path to jihad, leaving home to fight in Afghanistan when he was 19 years old. Why? Because it was the great jihad, they were told. You have a chance in Afghanistan to join with the Taliban and to fight the American invaders, those crusaders. According to interviews on militant websites, he returned to Algeria in the throes of the Islamic militant insurgency there, and then uh, later joined Algeria's Islamic armed group, GIA, in the 1990s. 